And now we're recording. Well, welcome, Tim. Uh, it's kind Hello, of a special doctor. situation. Yeah. <laughs> you are in Spain right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to work again on my, uh, yeah, on the way back, I think. Yeah. And so kind of, I suppose that's a good place to begin with the first question, because normally you would be somewhere else in the world, I, I would say, and, and probably you would be on the television in, in maybe Paris, Nice or somewhere like that. Uh, but you're not, uh, you're training. Uh, so what happened? Yeah. I, um, I had to, I, after the first stage of, of uh, the Vuelta Algarve, I, uh, I suffered from uh, pericarditis, and uh, although it will have no uh, long-term effects, or I don't feel anything about this anymore, but still, um, we thought it was the best way to have uh, to have uh, quite a lot of rest. So um, I took two days or two weeks off until the the last moment. I felt something, so to be completely sure. And I think it's also very nice of the team that they allowed me and also um, forbid me to do any exercise so so that uh, yeah there can really be no uh, no damage and no, no long-term effects well I, yeah it's not only nice of the team i think it's probably extremely smart uh, yeah. to, pr to protect their one of their most important riders uh so but 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 this is this was the after effects of you contracting covid uh just to be yeah. clear right we cannot be 100% sure, but yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's something you, you see quite a lot. And although we, we cannot uh, investigate that there's a direct, uh, that's mm. directly caused by this, but yeah, of course it's, uh, it's a bit suspicious. So it's, it's, there's a, there's a good chance it, it could be. Right. Well, definitely a cautionary tale. I, I, I got COVID basically the, same day or i came up positive right after i first spoke with you a couple of weeks ago yeah. so, so i've been yeah, recovering yeah. from covid myself but yeah. i but i've been lucky i haven't had a, a very uh it hasn't been significant and I, i'm feeling good uh so yeah. it does seem to really vary uh but you were doing yeah. a lot of a lot of hard training and, no and, yeah you know? I, I actually i i uh, i never had fever or i never had uh i had some symptoms but it was not uh, because i i always uh, track also my uh, my hrv and things like this and it was not really affected so i i thought i could uh, i could go but i i i took it quite easy but maybe after all maybe the, the first race was a bit was a bit too early because i had it in the night after the first race so i don't know if the, if something uh because I went really, really hard that stage, of course, then maybe that uh, something happened there. But yeah, hmm. we, I think we will, uh, we will never know for sure. But for me, right. the most important is that there is no uh, long term effect, but it's still sad to miss the classics, of course. Yeah, but you're not going to miss all of them. Uh, the goal is to be back in time for uh, Paris Roubaix. Is that correct? Yeah, but still, I, I don't see a really big chance. Uh, of that happening only when everything is really going well. It's not just about me being ready, uh, maybe for, but also I, I, I need to be, um, how I call this in English, I, um, that I need to be a, a better guy that somebody than somebody who that they let at home. So I got, I and, and our team, it's it's not so it's not so easy because yeah, it's one of the of the most important races of of the year and if i do this as, as, my, as my first race i think it will be yeah not so easy yeah. to, to go in the team so maybe we can do a smaller race before but mm. we have to see how uh, how the condition is uh, is developing yeah all right well you, you mentioned heart rate variability and and that's a nice uh, segue into the next question and i should add that these questions have basically come from uh, other big cycling fans and, and cyclists and sports scientists and people who follow me on Twitter. And then I've kind of tried to consolidate some of them. Uh, but, but the next question is uh, that 
cycling is a sport that's pretty obsessed with metrics. You can measure yeah. a lot of things in cycling. <laughs> that's true, so, yeah. Yes, or maybe more than almost any or any yeah. other endurance sport. Yeah. But uh, so the question is, what, if any, phys standard physiological testing uh, do you do or does the team have you do to guide your training? Um, yeah, first of all, I, I, I want to say that indeed there is so much things going on and so much you can do. And in the end, you, you cannot really do everything because yeah you get maybe you can uh, tend to get a little bit lost in all the numbers and and sometimes that it's contradictory as well but mm. the one thing that i that i'm uh, quite in love with the thing that i i use a lot is uh things like uh, i use the 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 aura ring it's not that i i, I have any interest in in this or because yeah, we need to pay it ourselves right. uh, but but i like a thing like that because uh, you have your hrv your heart rate you can yeah and things like this i uh, i always look into it and i also check in with my feeling and also what it is supposed to be because you know um a lot of time if you do a heart <clears throat> For example, in training camp, if it, at the end of the training camp, I already did a lot of work, of course, you know, your HRV will go down and it will not be great at the end of the, of the training camp, but that's expected. Mm -hmm. So, so that, you know, I can still do uh, a long endurance ride, even though my HRV is, is quite low, but it's, it's more to check if it, if it's something that was unexpected, maybe then to to change it, your, uh, your training, um, because, because it was a, a lower value than, than anticipated before. Okay. Well, so heart rate variability is a tool you use a lot. You've got Watts, you've got HRV, you've got your own feeling, as you said, you know, your body and in, in your perceptions. Mm -hmm. So if you, under normal circumstances, if you suddenly you get red flags, you know, from the heart rate variability, from your perception, everything's not feeling right. What, what's your usual first first response? How do you deal with it? Well, I think you, you have to think about quite a lot of things. Also, like um, the mental aspect as well. If you really have, oh, you, you really don't have uh, a good feeling to, to go on the bike, you think, oh, it's, I don't want to go. I don't, even though you don't, really feel bad that's already a first sign yeah uh, of course there can be other reasons as well but that's already sometimes a sign that that maybe you're uh, completely ready for it uh then yeah of course you you always i always also look at um at my body temperature if this is elevated yeah of course you don't train that's that's really a, a yeah. completely red flag um even then also the same amount of days after you had fever. Um, and then also, yeah, I think sometimes if you don't feel great, great, uh, when there, when you have to do efforts, then it's sometimes better to, not to do the efforts or try one. And if, if it's not really going, then or you go home or you just make it an endurance ride when you're still like okay but just too tired to make the the watts because you cannot head home every time um but yeah so uh, it's 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 always a mix between what you feel and also the watts you produce on the bike sometimes the body is also quite strange you can sometimes feel when you're in good condition but a little bit tired you can sometimes feel really bad for two three hours and then suddenly from one moment to the other and suddenly the legs start turning the, so yeah it's 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 sometimes quite difficult to judge but for sure yeah when you when you feel really bad or sick yeah then you just go home that's that's the red flag or you don't even just on the starter training 
Well, first of all, most most of us humans, we don't go for three hours and then suddenly everything feels good. <laughs> but I don't think I've ever experienced that. But but you're a you're a different kind of guy that that that, that might be a, a part of your reality. Uh, but I want to ask you: Are you you know a lot of endurance athletes are afraid to take a day off to just say yeah. I, today I'm not going to train? Is how is that with you? I think I, I would love to say the opposite because that's where <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I also studied to be a, to become a trainer after my career, but that's the, the part where it's really good to still have somebody. Even though I I also do a bit of my own training, but that it's really good for somebody else to say because you when you're in doubt and you you I sent to my uh, to my trainer uh, Tom Steels, and then always he's gonna make the shot and say you don't go. And sometimes right. it's better it's better that somebody else does it because sometimes uh, it's really difficult in in your head because you know yeah I, I want to have the best preparation as possible and then yeah even though it's it's not gonna matter if you if you don't go for that one ride but still you think I, I want everything to be to be perfect and maybe it's not it's not so bad and maybe I can still do it and I, I try it on the right. bike and we see. So even though I know I know from from yeah from the signs and everything that maybe it's sometimes better to rest, but yeah, it's, I think it's a bit uh, how how the cookie crumbles or how how they say right, right, right. Athletes are athletes, and and so yeah. I I appreciate your honesty because yeah. it's the same way whether it's my daughter or anybody I've ever met. Yeah. Or, you know, it's just it's very hard when for, in, for well motivated people like you that love to train to say today I need to sit on the sofa. Uh, so it's good to hear. I think that that's the same for the best as it is for everybody. So we can, mm -hmm. we all have to work at it. But the, another question that rolls into all this is, is kind of, I don't know, training philosophy, or uh, we have this question that says, what general training approach do you use? And does your approach differ from other riders on the quick step team? Um, I think in the end, not so much. I get this question sometimes that people think that I, I really do a lot of uh, gray work, for example, because if we, if you're talking about uh, the tree zone model uh, that I do a lot of zone two work, but in the end, I, I really don't do a lot. I, I try to train a little bit polarized. And also this winter I did I did it try to do it even more. Um we'd had some some good results in the beginning of the season, but it's not that I really, really ride in that um in that zone two where I have to perform quite a lot of time and I have to pull the bunch. But I don't really train on this. But what I do 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 uh, quite a lot of time is do some some short uh, or 15 to 30 minutes um, efforts just on my aerobic thresholds or just below. That's the thing that I that I do a little bit, but not not really uh, not really gray zone work. And then <clears throat> I even do uh, also a lot of time 30 30s or or things like that, just to to have a different stimulus to the body. And I think mm. when you always do the same, it's like a little bit when you're in the in under the shower and at the first moment it feels warm but only only when you change the temperature then you you feel against something and i think if you do always do the same similar in the end the body doesn't really react on it anymore so that's why i try to to differentiate a little bit uh, in my mm -hmm. training well, that's a good analogy uh, during your preparation period, let's say you're in, I don't know, let's say January, what would be a typical week of, in terms of hours of training for you? I think I, I always try to train in blocks of three days. That's something I, I, I like a lot. I can always, I try if, if it's possible, um, in, in, uh, to do the, the first day to do intensity because you're physically fresh and also mentally and you can mentally prepare a little bit for this um when i really want to get into shape that those those days are are really quite hard even uh yeah uh 
similar to to race TSS, um, but much more polarized, of course. But then the other days I, I tend to do just uh, endurance for two days, maybe the day after, uh, just three, four hours, and then one time a long effort. So and I think in my normal weeks with the average between 20 and 25 hours, but of course we have, a, when we do in the preparation period, we can have a little bit more. Um, mm. But really rest weeks, I don't do so much. I just take sometimes two, three, two or three days or uh, just some small two, three days off or just with, with a little bit of easy rides and then to build up again. Only when, uh, yeah, when, when one of the goals is finished, like for example, after Roubaix, you take five days off or, or, or after the tour or mm. uh, you nearly re really need the really rest periods, but it's not that I really do the three weeks, then one week off. That's mm. yeah. That's also sometimes a bit too, too difficult to do. Mm. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, so, if you let's let's talk about uh, you know since we're on the your training approach, your hard sessions they're hard as you said, and in some and you've been doing some of these uh, maybe thirty thirties or forty twenties. I'm not sure what kinds of uh, those intervals you do, but uh, we can all do some of them, but. How many does a pro rider do? What what would a one of these workouts look like for you? I think it's I don't know if, if we can handle so much more because sometimes it's also I think a little bit the opposite when I look a little bit into it because I think for um, somebody who is maybe less trained I think it's it's a bit less hard to go for example one hour on the aerobic thresholds. Or, yeah. or two or three hours for, and for example for us okay it's it's a it's a wide training they say but i can assure if you ride two or three hours on that aerobic threshold or when you have 220 watts then i'm i'm totally exhausted i'm completely dead so um i don't know if, if this is something that's that they, you, you guys also see in the science um and also i think yeah it, it depends a bit. For example, if if a sprinter, he he does three sprints of twenty seconds, he's completely dead. Yeah, and that for right. me, I, I go, <laughs> I, I go twenty times slower. It's like I'm, I'm not on the picture. But for me, this is not, it's not so hard. So I think I, I can say some, when I'm in shape, I do four times ten minutes, forty twenties or. Uh, sometimes some blocks of of four time four times fifteen minutes, uh, then with a little bit of rest in uh, right. some yeah an anaerobic threshold work or things like yeah. this. So four times ten or four times fifty. That's a big dose of forty twenties. Mm -hmm. And in your forty second periods, what are you hitting for watts? Let, well, let me before you tell me, let me give some calibration because you've told me that your aerobic threshold where is about 325 right 325 watts is that right yeah. or something like this yeah somewhere in there plus minus and then i've looked at your tour de france i i before i you knew i knew of you i'd already recorded uh, pulled up all your strava races for the tour last year so i knew <laughs> and 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 you're it based on just those rides and doing a power duration curve, it calculated about a 400 watt uh, critical power for you. Now right. that may be not quite right, but but that's just from the tour. Uh, so it gives at least an idea of what your threshold would be. So 325 on the first turn point, maybe, and then something like 400 watts, you would be uh maximum lactate steady state or critical power or something like that it, plus minus is that about right Just gonna take off. yeah uh, i think it's, he he, he is taking off his clothes now folks so it's getting serious <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. with those margin or with those calibrations in mind if you're doing 40 20s you're doing four times 10 or four times 15 minutes yeah what, yeah, what are I'm those? Not do four times fifteen minutes uh forty twenties then then it's some something something else I do. But then I always try to hit in the 40 seconds. Yeah, I think around 500. I just want to go above 500, just yeah. 500 okay. or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 
that's that's uh that's hefty especially <laughs> i could do that once or twice but but you're doing yeah. it for <laughs> 40 times so so and, and i think that's one of the big things we see with with the elite side is just the number that the the no, like you said that you know we can all do threshold but when you're holding 325 or 340 or 350 watts for two hours two and a half hours maybe three hours that's extremely you know high load so i think that's maybe one of the things that listeners will appreciate is that just the the duration that you're holding you know threshold is pretty far beyond what most people would think of as a, a, a as a threshold workout uh, it's you know several hours and i looked at your your data from the tour and and if we use 325 and 400 as kind of just rough calibrations you know you spent probably in the tour last year over around 40 hours above 325 watts yeah. uh that just so people get a feeling for that in a period of three weeks or 20 stages we uh, a couple stages we didn't have all your power data because maybe you had to switch bikes after a yeah, crack or something but but it's it, rough estimate you were for, 40 hours above 325 and pro and a lot of those hours above 400 watts so it's a lot of total you know hard work that you do um in in the course of those 20 stages so it, just to give people an idea but I'm going to get back on track because we can go. Let's see off the off the wire here. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Someone asked, how much of your training is done alone versus with others? Um, I think um, I like to train um, with others when I do the when I the effort day. I always I I almost do always alone. Sometimes I do it with uh, Eve Lampard if if uh, we do the same. Uh, but otherwise, I I, uh, I do it alone. And the other days, I when I can, I, I always write to them, and I write yeah, sometimes one hour alone, and then I do a loop with the guys, and then I and then I go back. So even then, I write twenty, or depending on how, how how much time, I always I almost always write a piece alone and a piece uh, a piece in the group. Okay. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so it, I guess an extension of that, which you kind of answered, what kind of sessions do you like to do alone? And it sounds like a lot of your extensive work you do at least partly alone. But then maybe do you do some of the interval sessions or the tough sessions uh, with others? The, 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 interv the intervals I always try to do alone because oh. I like the, yeah, the, the intervals. I, uh, because, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's difficult to, to have always the same... Uh, periodization uh, during the season and yeah I, I don't know why but when you it's always also difficult to do this in a group but because the chance you have to do exactly the same is so small so then it's just easier uh, to go alone and just look at your watts and not not go uh, try to really race or or anything but sometimes I, I do it with Eve and for example if we do uh, the one minute full gas, for example, mm. then then it's it's sometimes better if you have somebody next to you, even though it's not not so nice if you lose, of course, but still uh, <laughs> <laughs> it helps your uh, your watts to go a little bit higher. Yeah, well, that's it. So you you there's a, it makes sense though because you like to go to the front and just kind of be alone at the front of the peloton, yeah. and you like to train alone. So you're kind of in the wolf pack, you're kind of a lone wolf. Uh, yeah, but it's not that I I, I, I like to try. It, it's only the, the days when I have to do effort. The other days, I always try to find somebody. Just I don't like to be in, a, in too too big of a group. Uh, even on the on the trainings, I have to say I I, I like to spend some time on the front to have uh, to <laughs> maximize uh, uh, yeah, my training effect. But it's just it's it's more, mostly for the the mental part and to keep the motivation high that it's always nice when you when you see a group and maybe at the end of the training you 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 find a place and drink a coffee to coffee together that's the things that that uh, that make you really love training and and that the next day you really want to want to go out again yeah, yeah so it's it's because i've had a few tweets about this and talked a lot about it that 
you know, you're a pro and this is your job, but it, but would it be fair to say that you, you like, you enjoy it? That most, yeah. you know, of course. And I think it's, it's really no, no shame in, in, in trying to enjoy it even more. And although yeah. there are some days that you, that you think, yeah, because I really told it here on, on the training camp, cycling is such a nice job, but when you really, as a pro, when you're not feeling well and not, everything is not going well it's the shittiest job that there is because you're like waiting <laughs> waiting until until you get dropped and and look around and see all all those guys that that are performing better and then it's that is terrible there are there are some moments also when you for example have to go in in uh, in weather of two degrees and 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 rain or anything or or ride on the rollers for three four uh, i think i at least i I don't like this, but it's it's only some some days where, where you don't really like it, and and if you try to enjoy the other days the most, then uh, then then this will keep your motivation so much higher. And mm. yeah, I think this way maybe you can uh, make it a little bit longer career. Nice. All right. Well, one more question on this this training issue. There was someone that asked. Uh, and I'm sure it's a hard one to answer, but it says, what key training session should a keen cyclist ensure they do frequently to improve? So if you were a coach of age groupers, let's, you know, most of our people listening to this are not professional cyclists. Uh, is there, do you have a bread and butter session that you think would be good for just about everybody? I think I, I'm, I'm just going to say the opposite. Because I, I think if there's one thing, the key, but it, it is just consistency. That's the real thing that I would say. Don't try to make everything up in one session. It's it's better to don't go for the seven hours, but to be able to do the three-day block and then have a rest day, for example, then just to go out for seven, eight hours and have to recover from that one, one day where you did everything where you have to recover two or three days, then it's better to do three days with just three or four hours. And that's, that's just my idea. It's, it's not, yeah. I don't really believe in that one session that can make everything up is just, yeah. The consistency of, of, of all those, uh, right. of all those trainings. Well, boy, it's good to hear it from you. I, I say it this, a lot, but I'm not a pro athlete. So yeah. you, you know, you, it, I think it sounds stronger from you uh, that it is, it's all about the, not the epic workout, but the, the hundreds of workouts that you do. Yeah. And that's, and, that's and, really what I believe. I, and I know it's, it's, uh, pe people, uh, now they always look for shortcuts or so, but I, I'm afraid that this is just something that, that you have to sit out when you really want to, uh, of course, sometimes it's, it's also about fun. If you're just having fun or, or, yeah, if you think it's great to go to for that seven hours, then for sure do it. It's not that I have anything again. I, I it's just to be to be healthy and have fun. But if you really want my my idea uh, how you're gonna perform at your maximal level, then I think it, consistency is key. Good, thank you. Um, all right, another question. This one might not be as happy for you to talk about because we discussed this a little bit, and that is that you know, you've got your power profile and, and you're not 20 anymore. Uh, and you put in a lot of hours. And, and so the first question, I guess, is, you know, what is your peak power right now? If we were to say one or five second power or something like that, what do you think you can hit now? I, I think now I can only hit, I think one time I did for like 13, 50, but we do some testing every every year in the uh, Bacala Academy in uh, Leuven, and every year I go down a little bit. <laughs> Not so, yeah. It's it's something that I have to say. I also don't really train on this because, yeah, I think it's something that, yeah, that is just kind of lost for me. And I, it's like what I say: you cannot focus on everything. So. It's not something that I, I, I do a lot on my own, but uh, I do I do hard efforts, but not really not really the sprint. So I think it's something that uh, that I have to live with that I get a little bit slower uh, slower every year. 
Right. Well, while we're on that topic of change, because you've been in this game a while and, and that let's say, let's take another metric like uh, your so-called FTP here or 20 minute power or whatever. Has that changed significantly in the last five years? Um, I think it tends to go uh, maybe still a little bit upwards, I think. Um, and it's almost, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And on, when you're pro for so long, you cannot, you cannot make, uh, you cannot make huge, huge improvements, uh, anymore. But I think, uh, okay, this year and last year, I was unfortunate to, to miss the, the real testing, uh, during the training camp because, yeah, you have to spend a, a whole day. And this year, I suffered a little bit with my knee. And the, the year before, I had COVID on, the, on that time. So, yeah, I didn't really test it on on, um, on those occasions. And in the season, it's always so hard um, to do this. And you already spent uh, so much time racing that we don't really find the time. But we always do the, the testing in the winter. And it's uh, not only with me, but... With, with most of us, it, it really doesn't change a lot. It always yeah. kind of stays the same with the aerobic threshold and anaerobic thresholds. Sometimes it can change five or 10 watts, but it's not that there's a, a, a big decline or, or a huge, uh, huge improvement anymore. Right. Well, and that's what I would have expected you to say, to be honest. But, but one thing, just, just uh, I think today I, I, I tweeted a, a study that someone else did, Pet, Peter Leo and, and uh, Jamie Sprague uh, and uh, another, um, I'm forgetting the name now, but, but at any rate, they put out a paper where they were looking at basically the power duration curve fresh and the power duration curve after 2000 kilojoules for pros, it could be for world tour. It might be 3000 kilojoules. That would be the right, you know, amount of work that you've done to then say, what are you good for after several hours yeah. on the bike? Has that has, would you, has that changed for you? In other words, your, your durability, if we use that word that, you know, are you, do you feel like you're still adapting or, or you've had further adaptations in just the ability to, to produce pretty, you know, those, those high powers later in the race? Yeah, I think that's, that's maybe something that when you, when you get older, that a thing like this, um, will still, will still be improving for a longer time. Of course, it's, it's not that this, my, my idea, this is evidence-based, but it's just something I, I do feel that the real the real power you don't you're not able to push more. But when you get old and you when you did already so much work, but you keep on building um, the whole time more and more on, on what you already did the previous years, then I have the the idea that the durability is is not really going uh, is for sure not not going down at the moment. Okay. Not yet. Maybe this will uh, this will come. Uh, maybe this year. And I'm, I'm turning 33 <laughs> for now, so I hope I can I can postpone it for for as long as possible. Well, if Valverde is any example, yeah. you've still got some years ahead. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but yeah. this does this issue of durability brings us to another part of the equation because we've been talking about the training side and the and the expenditure side, but that you got to bring in. You got to you got to have energy. Uh, and so one of the questions from, uh, Twitter was, what is your nutritional strategy? And I've kind of packed it all together. And I said before, during, and after racing when, you, you know, because of these huge expenditures. So how are you, how are you managing this, this challenge of getting in enough carbs and, you know, the whole, the whole package? Yeah, this is something you, ca you ha really have to find a little bit on your own for sure like in, in a big tour i always um tend to lose weight even though i try not to but it's just i i have a quite uh, weak um stomach stomach and intestine so with me we, we try to that i eat a little bit more just after the race with a bigger snack 
and then a little bit less in the evening because otherwise I, I kind of had uh, some problems with this when you when you eat so much at 10 o'clock or, or sometimes 11 o'clock and then you need to go into bed with, with 12 at 12 o'clock and even drink a night shake before this is really <laughs> terrible for uh for 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 the the intestine so yeah um and during i just yeah try to hit uh, the 90 grams of carbs for uh, for as long as possible and before um i just try to eat two and two and a half from two and a half to three and a half hours before the race and i normally i don't really eat yeah sometimes i eat something really small one hour before but basically it's just a, a coffee and a, and go and then yeah. start to eat uh, as soon as the race as the race starts and you in your which hidden... is sometimes also not not possible when you when you have to control a classic when it's uh, 100 case where they where they keep on jumping and you need to control the right break weight and uh, then I know sometimes I will not last so long if I if I don't. Yeah, you can drink, but eating in that time is a, is not really so easy. No, yeah, and you we talked about this in a previous conversation that you know you you have to be totally warmed up and ready when the when the gun goes off because you may have to already go to the front and start covering a break in the first five kilometers. So that's a different, you know, I guess a bit different from you, uh, for you in terms of your pre-race preparation. Yeah, I think it's mostly mentally and also maybe clothes wise. I don't, uh, I'm never going to start a class as well uh, acting as the other guys, because I know it's, it's, I have to, I have to be up there from the gun. It's not that I really do a warm up or anything because in the end it's, it, it it also spends a bit of spend a bit of energy and it's it's all about uh, managing that uh, that energy for for as long as possible. It's a difference that this compared to a time trial, for example. So mm. uh, yeah, I I indeed uh, I have to be ready. And and ninety grams of carb carb carbohydrate per hour is where you're trying to go, and that's it seems like from the literature research literature that's pretty much an upper limit for what most people tolerate. And and you said you try to do that as long as possible. So do you feel like you your intestinal uptake you it deteriorates during many hours yeah. or what? Sometimes yes. Sometimes I I, uh, I have that idea what. Not not the days when you're uh, when it's easy in the bunch or you can uh, chit chat a little bit. Then then it's not gonna be a really an issue. But if it's a real long long and uh, and hard day where, where I think there's not a, not a sufficient blood maybe going to that system or a little bit less, right. then uh, this tends to be uh, tends to be difficult. And but then uh, the moment you feel this, then then also mostly the, the the time is near when uh, <laughs> when you're when you know it, it's it's gonna be super hard to uh, to still do right. the job because then you're not in balance anymore. You're not yeah. able to yeah yeah. Uh, well, and now we're now we're in the we're in a race, and you you know someone they they've gone out in a break, and you're doing what you do, which is to go to the front and maintain, you know, don't let them get too far in front. Uh, so how do you judge your intensity? Uh, you know, how are you guiding, you know, what are the guides you're used to know? Where do I need to be? 325, 350 Watts. Are you using your power meter? Are you going on feeling? What are you doing? A little bit of, a little bit of both. And also the, the third and maybe most, most important, uh, pillar is, is the advantage of the break. Because I always try to, yeah, to have as much information as possible of, of, of the the advantage and keep them within the range that you know that you can still take them or or maybe somebody else if if it's necessary. So sometimes this is a, a part where sometimes you have to go over what feels comfortable or or what you you know you can can hold for. A, for a really long time just because otherwise they 
they will go too far away and it will be difficult to to catch them so yeah it's it's a kind of a little bit of a mix about everything because also not not every day is the same and if you would just look at at the watts it's not that yeah the one day you can you can just hold it for so much longer and the other day you feel kind of blocked and also it, yeah you have to figure if you, if you have help from the beginning or that you hope that that at one point they will uh, some other teams will come and help you so then the, the part where you where you pull alone you maybe you can give them a little bit more to save some energy to so to to still be there when the when the other guys come and help so it's uh yeah, something that where it where it helps if you if you have a, a little bit of experience. Yeah, so it's it, no two days are the same, and you know I asked you previously, I, you know, do you do you do a certain number of hours, and then you're kind of like, okay, I'm done because I need to recover tomorrow. But I remember your answer being, no, it's not like that. I go, you go to until you're kind of cooked. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, almost. Sometimes it's it's something that the uh, sport director and, and my trainer Tom Steele sometimes he says, "Yeah, if in a, in a Grand Tour now it's it's enough. You you already already spent uh, enough energy. Maybe it's it's better to go, yeah, to go to the back. But mostly, I, I try to to do as long as I I can still do something for the team, which is yeah, uh, with which, which really helps them. I try to I try to be there and stay up there for as long as possible. It's not that I hold anything back, and then it's just hope. Uh, you just hope you're you're gonna be uh, you're gonna be recovered the day after. Yeah, and and you know we talk about the term talent, and obviously everybody in the in the peloton at the level you're at is or they're all very talented. But maybe one of the talents that you possess is the ability to recover pretty quickly or build your glycogen stores back up pretty quickly since you're so regularly having to do this job of, of producing pretty big powers for a long time. Is do you feel like, you know, is that is that a talent you have is just fast recovery? Yeah, maybe then I, I'm happy that uh, at least I have a uh, I have one talent, so uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah, maybe maybe it's something, yeah, and and also maybe that it has to do a little bit also with with your fiber type, maybe that uh, I, I'm I'm a guy with a lot of type one fibers. I and uh, I think maybe we are a little bit better at at recovering. We are not, maybe we are not able to go as deep as as a somebody who's predominantly type two maybe there's there's something in this but it's just something also about guys who are really really well trained and and also the the guy who go for gc they go also really until the limit mm. but until the really limit and then the day after if it's again a mountain stage they all, they again have to be up there so i think it's just not something only for, for me, but just for for everybody who, who have to do those uh, those big tours. Absolutely, right. And it, but they there is a reason they call you the tractor. <laughs> so <laughs> and those tractors every day you, you turn on the you turn the key and they they turn on and they go. Uh, and that seems to also be, be at least that's how it was for my grandpa's tractor is every day, you know, he could, he could just, it was always turned on as long as it was gas in there, as long as you've got gas in the yeah, engine. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the most and, important. Always have gas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see where we're at here. We're kind of coming towards the end. Um, I want, well, here's a good question. What brings you the most joy or satisfaction on a bike at this stage in your career? You know, uh, they, they, like, they talked about, is it catching someone? Is it, you know, just what, what's the, what makes you happy? Yeah. It's what make, what me, makes me really happy is just, uh, it, as it's so hard for me to win a race myself, it's just winning a race with a team where, you know, you, you, you played a uh, yeah a, a little bit of a role where you where you really have the idea that yeah you 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 may that you feel a little bit part of that victory even though it's it's only a small part when you know 
I really did a good job and in the end they, they won and maybe it's a, just that tiny little bit uh, also because of me and that gives me the the most joy that uh, of everything. Yeah. Well, I think you're very modest because I, when I hear other writers speak of you or through, you know, you, I think you've been selected as the, by the, by the writers as the best domestique, I think last year. And so obviously others think very highly of the role you play in, in those victories. Uh, but, you know, when I watch it, it's nice to know that those smiles and those hugs, they're real. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's something. Yeah. You, also after, uh, after a race when you're, yeah, obviously very tired because it was, uh, you're also a little bit more emotional and that's why I think we, we see yeah. such, uh, such reactions. I think there's also something that you, uh, that's, that's no coincidence that there are always so much tears after a race like Roubaix because everybody is just so exhausted and then your emotional balance is just a little bit different than, uh, than what it's, than it's what it's normally be. Right. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and, 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 and that brings us, you know, you, it's classic season coming up now. And, and, and one of the, one of the, uh, contributors here has asked this question, uh, does weight matter or not for a classics rider? And, and how does it matter? And he, he goes on, or I think it was a guy, he says, why are Alaphilippe and Von Aert competitive on the same courses with vastly different weight, except for the cobbles? So, you know, what's your take on this? Yeah, of course, weight always matters. And, and the part that you do not want to carry, uh, yeah, one or two kilos too much. You just want to perform at your, at your your weight, which is which is manageable and which is where you know you you perform good at, but the classics are like a little bit. Like, of course, those two guys are just exceptional exceptional riders, and just on the short uphill uh, uh, uphill climbs that uh, a, a parkour of the Ronde has, they're just I think in the same amount of what's what per kilo mm -hmm. uh, so that's just uh, why they are they are both up there and maybe maybe then an art is gonna be a little bit better on the flat and maybe uh, Julien maybe is just a tiny little bit better on a on a, maybe a non-cobbled climb uphill but in the end those things balance out a little bit and I think that's that's the reason why they they can both be up there of course when you go to the through the real mountains, you would say, yeah, maybe yeah, there Julian has a as an advantage. And when you go to yeah, the real flat DTs, then their uh, road maybe has a a small uh, small advantage. But it's just two real uh, exceptional riders, and, and on a parkour like the Ronde, there that's where they maybe kind of meet. So mm. because it's something also a little bit in between. Mm. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing to watch. Uh, well, we've come to kind of the end of the road. Uh, we haven't been eating hot wings or anything, so I don't know if you watch hot ones, but but we've done the questions. But there is one last question, um, and it's I don't even know if you are familiar with this guy. Uh, he's a speed skater named Niels van der Poel. Uh, yeah. He, he has a, a Dutch Dutch name, but he's Swedish. Um, and, and so he, he put out all of his training and his training philosophy and, and so forth. Not too long ago. I don't know if you've seen any of that. Yeah, I've, you, I've seen a, a little bit of it. I, I thought it was a little bit strange, but yeah, in the end still, yeah, it was, yeah. Also, uh, amazing to see which things he, he was able to do. So, yeah, it was also, yeah, I liked it that he put the, put out his data for the public yeah yeah well the question and and i think i, I kind of know the answer here but but I, it's an interesting one because you, you do see these kind of crossover situations so the question is okay Niels is going to retire but he's obviously done a lot of cycling and he's got a pretty darn good 
FTP. And, and, and so the question then becomes maybe in a general way, not just focusing on Von der Poel, but uh, what is the total package? You know, if you have these super, let's say you have a super talented, just motor, uh, can they can they compete on the world tour or or is the skill level just so high that they would not be able to to bring that power to bear what 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 do they need and, and how should they develop their skills of, of of course i think i would i would tend to say yes because the the, the most important part um is of course the engine but it's something that's necessary but it's it's not it's not enough to make it but for sure, on the on the engine part, I say completely one hundred percent yes. For sure, he has he has the engine engine to do it, and he maybe for sure uh, probably he he has an engine that's that's even bigger than uh, than most of the of the pro riders. But still, it's it it, it, it there's more to it than just than just uh, the the engine and and being able to to push hard on the uh, on the pedals. It's at his age, maybe it's not so easy to to have the the handling to ride in the in the bunch, and maybe there he will he will lose a little bit. Um, I think sometimes you also see it with people who who start r racing at a, at a little bit later level that sometimes they are not in the same category of of bike handling or riding in a bunch, or sometimes um, having tendency to, to crash a little bit more but i think it, those are all things that 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 he if he if he if he want to spend time that he can uh, that he can overcome of course you you also uh, there's not too big of a difference in how the way the, the muscles are used but still i think he, he will still need a little bit of time to get the efficiency a little bit better of of the muscles um so the muscles are are really uh, make a little bit of a shift um, because they are used to 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 work specifically on the way of the of the how the ski movement is done, and I think maybe it it takes a little bit of time just to to adapt them uh, to the cycling, even though it's not too different. But still, I think this will take it some time. But if you really want to to invest some uh, some time and some some effort, then I think it uh, it would be possible to make a, to make a really good rider out of him. Hmm. And if we go to the other end, because he's an established athlete, but if we go to the other end, you grew up in Belgium. You were a national U23 champion in Belgium. Um, what's the, you know, Belgium, Belgium, Belgium creates a lot of great cyclists and, and you could kind of use this as a, as a segue to a question of, how how should we develop young cyclists? What, what it, it, does track cycling make a big difference? Does the cyclocross is that a is that a missing ingredient that helps? Uh, you know, the roads of Belgium. What what's your advice to young cyclists? Uh, my my advice it, it depends on which age uh, we really are, but my my advice maybe it's a cliche but it's just it's a cliche sometimes because it, it, there's a lot of value in it is just go out and have fun and don't yeah don't really work already with a tight schedule when you're 13 years old or 14 years old just try try to have as much fun as possible if if you have fun in competition do competition if you have fun in in uh, the track then go to the track if you like more to get Derby and do to do uh, cyclocross, then you do cyclocross. <laughs> and if you want to do all three of them, just do all three of them. If you want to combine it with another sport, that's maybe even better on a, on a young age. And then just let let you slide a little bit into a little bit more professionalism as a time, but not not really from from one moment to to another. Just yeah, just maybe it's it's good to to just to know a little bit of about what you're doing and when you get a little bit older you you yeah maybe you you start to work with a trainer but i i would not do this when you're when you're really really young but the moment when when it's necessary to have a little bit yeah to be a little bit more professional than and and when you have a little bit of talent and you you want to you really want to to make some some 
sacrifices for this really from your own not from somebody else like like the parents or somebody else who says you you need to have this but if you really want this for yourself i think this is a is a good approach to have a to have a long, lifelong uh, uh to, to 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 really sport for for a uh, for life long well that's a wonderful way to end this interview and i i have to say if i were a parent of a child i i would think i think tim de Clark would be a great coach for that kid yeah. uh so i Thank think you've you. got you've got a future in coaching and uh because i just hear all of the 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 different aspects of it they're all part of who you are and what's made you a great athlete so i really appreciate the interview Pre appreciate you using your time here and we wish you i think we being everyone that you know knows of you, you were, they're all fans so we wish you a fast recovery and back up to full speed and and we'll see you uh see you on the front of the peloton soon again thank let's, you so much hope. No, with, uh, with a lot of pleasure. So I hope uh, you all enjoyed it. Great. Thanks. Okay. Ciao, ciao.